To be able to write scripts and API tests in Postman, you need to know the underlying language that makes it possible, JavaScript. In this tutorial, I will give you a brief introduction to JavaScript and cover the most relevant concepts for Postman. While this won't make you a JavaScript expert, if you practice along, by the end of the tutorial, you will be able to understand complex request bodies like this one and write basic JavaScript code and tests. If this sounds like what you're looking for, let's jump into it. I want to begin with by saying that JavaScript and Java are two different programming languages that apart from the name have not much in common. And with that being said, let's jump directly into Postman. So I have opened here in Postman a new tab. And in order to be able to write JavaScript in Postman, there are essentially two places where you can do that. And one of that is here in the pre-request script, and the second one is here inside the tests. So in order to actually be able to execute even the most basic script, we first have to enter here an address. Now I'm gonna use, just for testing purposes, httpbin.org slash get. That's a very simple endpoint. It will not do anything. We are not really interacting with this API but it's necessary to have an address to be able to write any JavaScript. And I will begin writing JavaScript code here inside the test. And this is essentially the editor where you will be writing tests. There's not a possibility to integrate an existing IDE like Visual Studio Code and to write your code there. You have to write everything inside Postman. Now, the first concept I want to talk about is variables. And variables are a way to store data, at least temporarily, during the execution of the script. And we'll be using variables quite a lot when writing any script. And using a variable is like putting something into a jar and adding a label on it. If you need the contents, you just need to remember the name of the label. So in that way, we'll be able to retrieve that information. The contents of the jar is what we want to store, and the label is the name of the variable. So let's begin by defining a variable. And when looking over JavaScript code, you may notice something that looks like this var. And let's say here name equals something. The problem with var is that it is deprecated. So we don't want to use var. Var is an older way of defining a variable. And essentially, we'll only use let and const and we'll go over them soon. So I'm gonna write here let. This is essentially telling JavaScript, hey, we want to define a variable. Name of the variable is name. Maybe I haven't chosen the proper variable name. Let's say first name would be a better one. First name. Notice how I've written it. And after the equal sign, I can give it a value. So for example, I can write here John. So first name is John. Now, because John is actually a string, we have to put it between quotes. Otherwise, if we would send this request, essentially executing this code, and we're looking here at the test results, you will see here, there was an error in evaluating the test script, reference error, John is not defined. The reason for that is JavaScript will think that John is a variable because it looks pretty much similar to first name. So this is why we're gonna put it between quotes. And additionally, we're gonna terminate this instruction, this statement of defining a variable with a semicolon. This is essentially after each instruction that we write in JavaScript, you will terminate it with a semicolon. Okay, so now if we're running this again, you will see that there are no errors. But it would be nice to actually see that this variable has been set. So what we can do then is we can use console.log. You will see here that when I start typing something, there is this autocomplete functionality so that I don't have to type everything from scratch. And I'll open here this parenthesis and provide a parameter. And that parameter is what we want to log. Now we can log a name like John. Instead of writing John here again, we can simply reference this variable called first name. I can write here first name. This already gets auto completed. And I'm going to terminate it with a semicolon. 
Here inside Postman, you will find this console. If you click on it, you will see everything that has happened in the past. If you see too many entries here, simply click here on clear, and that will eliminate anything that's just hanging around here. So let's hit that send button again, and the code will get executed. So the code console.log, what this will do is will lock this information, write this information to our debugging console. The debugging console is something that we'll also use a lot to try to understand what our scripts do, and especially when something doesn't work, we will use console.log a lot to inspect the value of the different variables that we have. So we'll see here, this contains John. So, so far, so good. Just as well, we could use here, for example, a const. So this will define a constant, let's say age, for example. So age is 30. And we can also lock that property. So we can specify here an addition argument in the console log that will work as well. So we'll have here John, and John is 30. And you'll notice here that I haven't put 30 between quotes. And the reason for that is John is a string, but 30 is a number. And we're going to talk about different data types in just a second. But I wanted to point out the difference between first name and age. Now, with first name, if for whatever reason later on I decide to change something about it, I can simply write here first name. And let's say... It's no longer John. I want to put here, let's say, Mary. Okay, so for whatever reason, I'm changing the content of this variable from John to Mary. So if I'm logging this again, you'll see here, now we have Mary and I have age 30. Now, if I'm trying to do the same with age, and let's say I want the variable age to be 35, what will happen is that I will get an error. Because a constant implies that you will not reassign it to another value. Now you can see first name with let is a variable. It can change the contents of it. But with a constant, we're saying this is something that we're not going to change. So for that reason, in many cases, we'll use let a bit more than const. But don't worry so much about it. If you're using const and you're getting one of these errors, it means that you should be actually using let for that. And this will make more sense as we make more progress throughout this. But don't worry about it so much. Just remember, use most of the time let to define a new variable and to assign it to a value. Now, in JavaScript, there are different kinds of values. And now we need to talk about data types. Now, data types are essentially what we can store in our variable jar. What kinds of things can you put inside there? And as you have seen so far, we have a string. So this is a string. And just as well, we can define a string, let's say last name, and put a value in double quotes. That will work as well. So that will be a string. Most of the time, you will use single quotes, but double quotes work. Not going to get too much into that. You also have seen that we can write numbers. So you will see here that age is 30. And let me just remove some of these. Age is 30, so this is a number. But we can also define another variable, some other number. And this can be with a floating point. So for example, it can be 0 0.25. So that is also a number. It will work without any issues. Now, most of the time, you will be working with numbers and strings. And the other data types are Boolean, undefined object, and arrays. We'll be covering those as well as we progress throughout the course. But I wanted to show you in terms of working with strings is how to concatenate them. So what do I mean by to concatenate them? For example, you have first name and last name, and you want to put them into a single value. So you can define here another variable called, let's say, name. And you can write here something like first name plus last name. And let's lock this variable to see the value. And see here the value is John Doe. There is no space in between. So in order to add a space, we need to add a new string. So I'm going to write here 
either with single or double quotes, a string that only contains an empty space. And I'm going to use again the plus sign to concatenate this first string, which is now inside a variable, this empty space string, and also last name, which is another string. There's also the possibility of using what is called string interpolation. And that is working in a similar way, but instead of using the plus sign, I'm going to start here the entire string with a backtick, and we're going to end it with a backtick. So this is not a single quote, it's a backtick. Otherwise, this syntax will not work. So we're going to write here a dollar sign, open a curly brace, and write, for example, first name. And then we can simply add a space, a dollar sign, and write last name. So this will achieve a pretty similar result as the first one, but we don't have to add so many plus signs. And this can make it a bit easier when you're working with this. Just as well, if you wish, you can provide this entire expression here as a value to console log. So you don't always need to define a new variable or anything like that. Now, since we have explored these basic data types, let's look a bit into building some logic. And the most common way how we do this is by writing an if conditional. And an if conditional is something that looks like this. We're going to start with if. And here inside the brackets, we have to add a condition. And if that condition evaluates to true, then we're going to execute the code block that we see here. So for example, you can write here something like console log. This was true. So this is just for debugging purposes. And the condition that we have to write here must evaluate to a Boolean. Now, a Boolean is another data type, and it are essentially two values. It can either be true or it can be false. So whatever we are evaluating, it can be true or it can be false. So in this case, whatever we have here, this will always evaluate to true. This is just a way to put this expression in a way that it's working. If we add here, for example, false, this will not evaluate. Now, of course, there's nothing dynamic about this, so it's not really helpful. So in order to make it helpful, we have to write some conditions that will evaluate to either true or false. So in order to write such conditions, we can make a statement, something like saying first name must equal, and we have to use the triple operator sign. Otherwise, if you only use one equal sign, we'll do an assignment, pretty similar to how we have assigned first name equals John, and that will always evaluate true. If you write two equal signs, that will be a very weak condition that we are testing for. So we're always using three equal signs because that will ensure that whatever we're testing is working properly. So for example, if I'm writing here something like, if first name equals, say, Mary, then I will say here, this is Mary. Okay. And in this case, the first name is actually John. So John will not equal Mary. So in that case, this entire if block that we have here will not be executed. We can add more if blocks and things like that. Say, for example, we want to turn around this condition and to make it to negate it. So then we can write it like this. And then we can change the console log message. So if the first name is not Mary, then we can do something with this. And we're using console log just to make sure that we are actually entering this if block. The console log statement does not appear in our console. Then it means that whatever we evaluated here was false. So in this case, first name is John. John does not equal Mary. And we can say this is not Mary. We can also write more conditions involving numbers, for example. So we can say here, let's say H, which we haven't defined yet, is greater than 30. And this is another operation that we can use. Greater than, smaller than. So that's a possibility. And to write our if there. 
but we can also combine multiple statements together using logical operators. So for example, we may want to check that the first name is not Mary and also that the last name is something else. We can use logical and, and the logical and will be two ampersand signs. And then we can start writing another condition. So for example, we write the second condition is, let's say last name does not equal though. This time, in order to get inside the if block, the first condition has to be evaluating to true. And also the second condition must be evaluating to true. So let's see what's happening here. You will see here that we're not getting inside here. There's nothing happening. And the reason for that is still the same. The first name is John. So John is not Mary. And the last name is Doe. Unfortunately, the last name is Doe. So in this case, the second statement is then false. So both here has to be true, here has to be true in order to get it to run. If you only want to have one of the parties be true, then we can use the logical OR operator. So the logical OR operator has simply two pipes. And if any of these evaluate to true, and we know the first one will evaluate to true, the second one will not evaluate to true. But still, if you run it, this is not Mary. Okay, so this, and the second statement doesn't matter so much because the first one was true. Let's talk for a minute about functions. And we'll be using console.log a lot, but we haven't really explained what it is. We know what it does, but we're not really sure what it is. In JavaScript, a function performs an action. For example, log on console is a function. And actually, console itself is an object. We're going to talk about object in a second. But console.log is a function where the value that we provide as an argument, for example, what we put here, this is what we call an argument, will be given to this function and the function will do something. A function is a way to encapsulate code and to make it easier to reuse that code. So in this case, we don't really know and honestly, we don't even care how this text gets displayed here. This is why we're using this function. Postman has implemented this log function that we can use. They write this in the console and display it here nicely, but we don't care how they do it. Still, most of the time, we want to be able to define our own functions. And the reason for that is because we want to reuse some functionality, but also sometimes we want to encapsulate our code. To put it like that, we want to put everything under an umbrella so that we know that this functionality does something and it's easier to maintain. So without talking too much about this, let's simply go ahead and define a new function. So I'm going to define here a function using function, of course. And after function, we have to say, what's the name of the function? So the name of this function will be say hello. It's a very simple function that says hello. So again, we're going to rely on console log to simply display a message that will show that we have called our function. So say here, hello, very, very simple. So now in this case, if I run this script again, there's nothing actually happening. We have defined a function, but we haven't called a function. And calling a function is a very important thing you need to understand. And the way we call a function is that we refer to it by the name we have defined it. In this case, we're going to say here, say hello, because it's the name of the function. And it's also important that we add these brackets at the end, because otherwise we're not actually calling the function without using those brackets. So let me show you in a second what I mean by that. So in this case, I'm calling the function, say hello. When this code gets executed, it jumps inside this function and executes this line of code. Not super complicated. I'm going to make it a bit more advanced. But that's the basic idea here. Now, if I'm removing this, 
I'm only getting a reference to that function, but it's not actually doing anything. So remember that in order to call a function, you also need to add this. So far, our function is not really so useful. It's essentially doing the same thing as we did before. And this is the point where you need to learn about input arguments. And input arguments is pretty similar to what we have provided to console.log. We have said log this variable, log this string, log this and that. And functions, most of the time, will also require some input information. And the way we provide this input information is by defining some arguments. So for example, we can define here an argument called name. And we can define another argument, say, for example, age. So we can say here something like, say, Mary. And I'm going to separate it with a column and say 30. So these are name and age. They're essentially like two variables that we have defined. And then we can use these variables inside the function, anywhere inside the function. So we can say here something like hello. And as you remember, in order to use this nicer syntax, we can use name. You can say here hello and it will automatically take the value. So this will say, hello, Mary. And just as well, I can add age. As you can see, currently I haven't used age inside here. Just as well, I can use other variables that are in this part of the script. So for example, if I'm trying here to use something like first name, we'll say here, hello, John. So there's also a way to skip using these arguments. But most of the time, it does make sense to define the arguments because it is a way to say, what are the inputs? What does this function actually need in order to work? And if you're just reusing some variables you have defined somewhere in the code, it's not really transparent, like what are the inputs and what are the outputs? And because I said outputs, that's an interesting one. What is the output of this function? Well, it has this functionality of using here console log. So it's logging something. But that's rather a behavior and not necessarily speaking an output. Now, for example, let's put this inside console.log. And in this case, we're going to call the function, but we're going to get the output of the function. So the function has been executed. You see here, hello, John. But after that, we get undefined. Well, undefined is another data type in JavaScript. And it is a bit harder to grasp, but you need to understand it because you will probably get it quite a lot in errors. And you need to understand what undefined is. Now, undefined is something that hasn't been defined. In this case, the function hello world has not defined a return value. So to understand undefined, let's understand what a return value is. You can go here inside say hello, and I can use the return keyword to return something. For example, I can return a string. Okay, not super useful, but now we are returning something. By default, if we don't use return to return a value, JavaScript does it for us. We're returning undefined. So it's something that doesn't exist, essentially. It's not defined. This makes more sense, especially if you're trying to use functions in a different way. For example, we can define a function that will add two numbers. So let's say add A and B. And we don't even need console log here. We can simply return a plus b. Of course, there's nothing preventing us from defining a variable called total, where we put here a and b, and then only return total. That will work just as well. Now, there's an important concept I want you to notice in regards to variables. There are different types of variables that we have defined. So as you have seen before, we have defined first name and last name, and we were able to 
access last name and first name or anything else that we have inside here, inside the script. But what's happening if we're trying to log, for example, total? You'll get the error that total is not defined. That's weird. Well, the reason why total is not defined is, first of all, we haven't executed this piece of code. So let's try, for example, to add two numbers. Let's call add one and two, and then lock total. Still not working. What's going on here is that the moment we open this curly braces here, we have created a new context. And in this new context, this is something that's separated from the rest of the script, which is here. And in this context, we have defined this variable, we have assigned values to it, and we have returned it. But this variable, it's hidden from the rest of the variables that are available inside the main script. So whenever we are creating a function, we're defining variables, they are only available for that function and they don't go outside of it. It's a nice way to encapsulate information. And this is also one of the reasons why we're using let and const and not using var, which will give us some weird behavior if we would use that. So just wanted to point that out. Now let's go back to what we have so far. So we have to define these two variables. Let's define another variable called age. And as you can notice, these variables are somehow connected. At least the values that they have, they are related. John Doe, which is 30 years old, maybe has here, let's say, an email address. Apparently, they all belong to a single person. And by simply looking at the code, well, we, we could understand that they are related. But if we had like other 20 variables mixed in between, it would be hard to know which variables belong to a person, which variables are used for other purposes. So for that reason, quite often in programming, we rely on objects. And an object is a fundamental data structure in essentially any object-oriented programming language. And an object is a representation of some data that is somehow related. In this case, we're trying to represent here a person by defining different properties. So with objects, instead of defining so many variables, we define an object that has properties. So it's a way to group all these variables together, but to only define one variable. So let me show you what I mean by that. Now let's define here another completely new variable from scratch. I'm going to call it person. And again, with the equal sign, we're going to open and close a curly brace. This is how you define an object. Now this object does not have any properties and it's really not very useful. We could use console log to log it, but it will not be anything inside. So we need to start adding some properties. Now to add properties, you can do it directly when you're initializing it. This is what we call it when we give it the initial value. So for example, we can put here first name, column, we're not using equal anymore, and we're giving it John. So that's the value of the property. And a similar fashion, we're gonna separate it with a comma, Last name will be Doe. And just as well, we can add age, and this will be 30. So we change a bit the notation, but the output is pretty similar. And I'm just going to remove this from here so that we have more space on the screen. And I'm going to use console.log to take a look at what we have here. And now you will see we have an object. And it has the properties of first name, last name, age, and all these properties are in a single variable, which is called person. We still have name, we still have email, which we haven't added so far. And it may happen that you don't have all the information in the beginning. So you may start with an empty object and later on you add properties. So if that's the case, you can use person and then specify a property, for example, email and assign it a value, like this one here. 
So now we have defined the object initially. Later on, for whatever reason, we have figured out we have this additional property that we want to add. We're using this dot notation, person.email, and then we have this information. So if we're logging it, taking a look at the values, you will see it has first name, last name, age, and now this additional property called email. Now, quite often, you don't really need the entire object. And especially in Postman, if you're trying to write some assertions, maybe you're only interested in age. And the way you get the property age is by using this dot notation. So if you want to see here only the value of age, I can write person dot age. And what will be locked to the console is only the value age. Now, how you name the properties matters. And especially when you're trying to retrieve a single property. If I write here H with a capital A, that's not the same property as H. You will get here undefined. And this is something that is like a bit mind-boggling for some people. They're looking at their object and saying, I have H. I have written H. Why doesn't it work? It doesn't work because H written like this is not the same as age written like this. So you have to be very careful. And especially if you're in the beginning, I definitely recommend simply copy pasting things instead of writing them yourself, because that will save you any errors that you may make if you're typing things on your own. So that's something to pay attention to. There's also another way of getting properties from an object. And that is another notation. So we can use a notation with square brackets. So for example, I can write here, instead of a dot notation, I can add here square brackets. And between the square brackets, I will provide a value, a string essentially, with the name of the property. Now, pay attention. If I would to leave this as it is, person, this is the reference to the person object I've defined. Age, as it is right now, JavaScript will think that I'm trying to use a variable called age. I don't have a variable called age, so this will not work. We'll say here, age is not defined. So whenever you're getting something like this, something is not defined, be very careful. You may have wanted to actually write a string between quotes and not something without quotes. So. This here, between quotes, is a string. What I had before was a variable that was not defined. So if I'm running this, this is a different way of getting this property. Now, as you can see, having these square brackets, having these quotes, it's a bit more complicated than simply adding a dot. But there are some use cases when it does make sense to use it like this. So let me explain what I mean by that. I'm going to simply create a comment. So the way you can create a comment is by using two slashes. You will see here in Postman, this has been grayed out. It means that this line of code is not being executed. You can also comment out larger portions of code. If you use a slash, star, star, slash, just to comment out a piece of code that spans over multiple lines. This is just like a quick introduction to writing comments. Now, this piece of code will not get executed. And just for demonstration purposes, I will create here another variable called, let's say, email. But I'm going to write it like this, email. And I'm going to put here the same value. Now, I want you to pay attention to what's happening right now in the editor. Postman is complaining, and you will see this is underlined in red and probably also here on the right-hand side or sometimes on the left-hand side, you'll see something in red. This means that you have made a mistake. The way you have written this is not correct. And why is that? Well, the reason for that is when I added this dash, this minus sign, this is also an operating in JavaScript. So when I'm doing something like this, JavaScript may think that I'm trying to create an expression and that's not really how it should be made. So I have to put this between single quotes, for example, say, well, wait, I'm not trying to define anything there. 
This is just how I like to name my property. Okay. So pretty, pretty simple. This is how I like to name my property. Uh, I just wanted to use that dash inside there. And that's totally fine. JavaScript has no problem with that. If I want to name it this way, totally fine. You make it this from APIs, from responses, all kind of characters that don't follow like this typical pattern that we'll see a lot that we're using here in these examples. So you still need to work with this kind of thing. Now, how do I get this? If I'm writing here person.email, I'll get the same issue here. I'll not get here an, an error, but essentially we'll see here that mail is not defined. So what JavaScript is thinking is that we're trying to get the property E from person, which is undefined, as you know. And we're not, you're trying to subtract mail, which is a variable we haven't defined. So this is why this is failing altogether. But that's absolutely not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is simply get this property. So again, using this bracket notation, going to add here bracket, going to put this entire thing between single quotes, because when it's between single quotes, I can write anything I want inside. I can add any characters I wish. JavaScript will not complain. And then there's, there's the value. This is how we can get it. All right. Now, one more thing about objects is that they don't only store this kind of values, okay? We can go a bit deeper and we can even store functions. Now, I was saying previously that console.log that we haven't really explained it, we have been using it a lot, but if you haven't really explained it. And you can see here in console.log, there is this dot, which means that log, well, what, what is log? Is it a property? Well, it's not a property because if we're trying to, for example, call person that first name and call it like this, it will say first name is not a function. So this means that we can write functions. We can add functions to our objects. Interesting. So how about let's try to we have this say hello function here. How about we copy this? And this time we're going to change a bit the way we, we write this. So we still have to define it like a property. So I'm going to say right here, say hello. I'm going to paste here the function. And as you can see now, the name is here in essentially the property. I'm going to simply remove this return value because we don't really need it here. And for example, what's happening if we simply call... What do we have here? Name and age. This is something that we're not going to get. We already know all the information that we have. So we could try first name. Let's see. So we're going to use person dot say hello. We're going to call this function. We're going to see here first name is not defined. And that is essentially true. We haven't defined first name. This here, first name, this is not a variable. And this is the syntax for getting a variable. So in order to get access to this property that we have inside the object itself, we could write something like person dot first name, and we'll say hello John. But most of the time, if I make a change to this variable, it will impact this one as well. So quite often we use this. This is a magical word in JavaScript. Can mean a lot, but at least in this context, this is referring to this object. So I'm saying this first name, this is the first name. So it's referring to the object itself. It's a reference to the object where this function is defined. So let's continue exploring objects and understanding how they work. And for a second, I want you to talk about JSON versus JavaScript. And in order to understand this, we need to take a look at what we have so far. So person is an object, and this is a JavaScript object. Now we can take this JavaScript object and convert it to a string. And the moment we convert it to a string, we can send it as a message. We can send it 
how we call it over the wire. So for example, an API will not send you JavaScript. Well, it theoretically can send you JavaScript code, but most of the time an API will send you JSON. Now JSON is indeed a representation of a JavaScript object, but it is a format that you can use in different programming languages. So you don't need JavaScript to understand JSON. This is just a way to store the data. So let's take a little moment to understand how this looks like in terms of transforming this JavaScript object into JSON, but also what it means to transform JSON back into a JavaScript object. So we're going to start again with console.log just to see the output of a function that we're going to use. And that function is on the JSON object and it is called stringify. So stringify will take, we'll see here, whenever I'm opening a function, we'll also get this help. And we'll say here, you know, we're going to give something in JavaScript. And it's going to convert it to JSON, which stands for JavaScript object notation. So what we're going to convert here is this person object. And if we're looking here, this may look pretty similar. You'll see it still starts with a curly brace. It ends with one. But this is no longer JavaScript. What we have here, and we would store this into a variable, this is simply a string. You will see here it is between double quotes. It's a double quote in the beginning, a double quote at the end. And I can send this over the wire to someone and someone else can parse it and can create an object in any other programming language that supports objects. So this is the stringify. Let me put this into a variable. So I'm going to write here something like let person JSON. So just to exemplify with person.json, I cannot access a property like age, for example. That's, that's not going to work. If I'm trying it out, console log person.json age, we'll see here undefined. It doesn't exist. This is just a string. It doesn't have a property called age. So if we're getting a JSON representation of an object, but we want to interact with it, what we can do here is to use json.parse. And you can see here how I'm essentially combining these functions one in one. So I'm here and outside, I'm using json.parse to parse something. And also this one is another function that takes an argument. Whatever the return value from this one is given to JSON parse. So if I'm looking at this, now I'm getting the property 30. So this has been again converted into a JavaScript object. Now what you've seen so far, this JSON stringify, JSON parse, this is something that you may encounter when working with objects. You see, objects have this property that a lot of things are stored by reference. So for example, you could take here Define another variable, say person2, and I'm going to say here person2 equals person. So you may think that you are creating a copy of this original object. And let's say for person2, you set the name, person first name to Mary. Okay. Now let's take a look at what actually happens with person1 and person2. You will see here that person has the first name Mary and person two has also the first name Mary. This is because in this case, we only created another variable, but that variable is essentially pointing to the same content in terms of like what we had in the jar. It's like an empty jar which says you'll find the content of this into the other jar. And that's pretty annoying and can also lead to a lot of bugs. And in order to create a copy of an object, we actually need to use JSON stringify because we're converting it to a string and then we're parsing it again into a JavaScript object. What's important to remember in this case, 
with stringify, we're losing this function. This function is not part of JSON. A function is an implementation in JavaScript, so we can write JavaScript code. But because JSON is a data representation, which also needs to be compatible across different systems, we cannot simply put there a JavaScript function. So this is why when you're using JSON stringify on a JavaScript object that contains functions, functions will be excluded from that. Okay, so let's clear a bit of code that we have here and to move on to arrays. And arrays in JavaScript are also kind of an object, but it's a different kind of an object. An array in JavaScript is essentially a list of things. You can have a list of numbers. You can have a list of strings or a list of objects. And a list makes sense. For example, uh, let's say for this person, we want to keep track of the social profiles. So we can write something like social profiles as a property or social profile one. Okay, you can write Facebook. And then if you want to add social profile two, then we have to create a new property, let's say for TikTok. And maybe there's also Instagram that we need to store. So then we're going to start, okay, social profile three, and we're storing Instagram. Of course, we can't know in advance, like how many social profiles we need to store and just creating properties like this, which essentially store like this, essentially the same value or types of value, doesn't really make a lot of sense. For that reason, we are using lists. We are using arrays. In an array, we typically store values that are somehow related to one another. Don't get me wrong. There is no rule. We can, you can store a number and a string and an object. But most of the time, in an array, you'll find similar values that are somehow related. So in our case, we're going to define an array. So let's define here an array. I'm going to start again from scratch here. I'm going to say here, social profiles. And the way we are going to define an array is by using square brackets. One square bracket and one at the end. This indicates an empty array. An empty array is technical an array. It doesn't contain anything. So if you want to add something to an array, we have to add values comma separate. So for example, we can add Facebook. I'm going to simply copy it from here. So now we have an array with just a single value. If we want to add TikTok as well, we have to add a comma, and then we can add TikTok. And with Instagram, we'll add that as well. If you're adding strings, make sure you put them between quotes. If you're adding numbers, it's totally fine. You can also add objects. That's also fine. So let's take a look at this array console.log social profiles. You will see here five indicating how many items are in this array. And each item will have an ID. It's called a key. It's a way to identify that item and to give it an order in the array. An array is essentially an ordered list of things. The first item and we're starting the count from zero. The first item is Facebook. The second item is TikTok. The third item is Instagram. The fourth item is a number and the fifth item is an object. So far, so good. If we are not sure how many items we have inside an array, we can use a property called length. That's available for any array. So if I'm writing here dot, as with an object, we'll find here many functions that are available. We can write here length. You will see here that this is a property. This will give us a length of five. Now, what if I'm trying to get only a specific property from this array? In order to get values from an array, you need to know the index, the key, the index key, essentially. And the way we do this is by using this bracket notation. So we're going to write social profiles, bracket. And let's say we want to get Instagram. 
Now, Instagram is the third item in the array. But once again, be careful, we are counting from zero. So the third item in the array will be the one with the index two. And you will see here Instagram. So now since we kind of understood how this array works, let's go ahead and move it inside our object. So I'm going to replace here these social profiles with a property called social profiles and just going to add this list here. And of course, we have to add a comma here, otherwise this will mean that be a valid declaration. The next challenge is getting this TikTok property now that we have this array inside an object. So what I'm recommending in this case, again, using constant.log, how do we get to TikTok? This is something that we're trying to figure out. So let's start with person. First of all, let's say we have no idea what this data structure is there. And we'll see here that we're starting here to have a list of all the properties that are available. And we can expand these properties and we can see here, okay, TikTok is available here. So we're inside the person object. And the first property is social profiles. So let's write social profiles. Now we are inside social profiles, but we're trying to get this TikTok value. Now, this looks like an array. So we know that in order to access this information, we have to write here the respective index. Respective index for TikTok is one. And this is how we get now this value. Now, there's absolutely nothing preventing an array from storing objects. And as you have seen here, this is an object. We can add here a property called name and give it a value one, two, three. And as a challenge for you, you can just pause the video and figure out how to get this property one, two, three. So once again, let's start from the beginning. We are having this person object, first name, blah, blah, blah. Where is this property one to three? Well, this is hidden somewhere in social profiles here. Okay, so how do we get there? Well, we're inside the object already. So we're using social profiles, that social profiles. Let's see if this works. It works, okay, we're getting an array. So we know this is an array. So what, what does an array expect from us? That we, we want to get deeper into it, we have to specify the index. So the index for this one is four. Perfect. So I'm gonna write here four. Okay, what are we getting next? Good question. Well, apparently we're getting an object and that object has a property called name. So on this item from the array, we're gonna call the property name because it is an object and has a property name. This is how we got to one, two, three. By navigating through this nested data structure, we can have objects containing other objects. We can have array containing objects, anything in between. That's definitely possible. And you will encounter this kind of nested data structures quite a lot. So it's important you understand the concept around navigating such data structures in order to access a single property. As you have seen previously, when we are working with arrays, there are a lot of things inside there. When we're trying to use this autocomplete for an array, you're getting a huge list of functions that are available and they're already built in from JavaScript. And we're gonna explore some of these functions so that you understand how to use them. So we can either start with an empty array or use this existing one, makes no difference. We can write here person dot social profiles, this is the array, and I write here dot, and we'll see here a list of functions that are available. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but I just wanted to point out a few important things. For example, what if we want to add another social profile? We can use push. So push will allow us to push an item. And let's say we're adding here YouTube. 
using console log to make sure that we are on the right track. Person that social profiles. So now our array will have six elements, including YouTube. If you wish to remove elements from an array or to get elements one by one, we have to look into pop. So dot pop. Now pop will not take anything, doesn't take any arguments. You'll find here it removes the last element from an array and returns it. This is kind of interesting because if you're trying to get rid of the last object that we have, this will be returned here. We can save it in a variable. But since we're not setting it in a variable, we're losing it. That's totally fine. So if you're running this again, you'll see here that the object that we had is no longer there. And if we're using pop two times, we only now have the original array with the social media profiles that we wanted to have. It's super simple and there are many array functions that you can learn about. I will not get into more, but I just wanted to let you know that this is definitely more, especially when it comes to working with arrays, adding elements, getting elements, sorting arrays. There's much more that's already built in into JavaScript. Now I wanted to move on to another important concept and that is loops. And loops represent an essential concept when dealing with arrays or for that matter, for any kind of properties that we can enumerate. Now, quite often we have this array of social profiles and we want to iterate over this array. For example, we have a list of numbers or we're trying to search for something. And we're going to look at some ways to go over this array. So let me first say that I'm going to remove this from here. And also this pop is something that we don't no longer need. And one of the most basic loops that you can create in JavaScript is with for. So this is the classical for loop. And the way it works is more or less like this. So for, and we have defined some conditions here. And then essentially we then have some information. So the for loop will start with a variable. So I'm going to define here. Let this will be essentially a counter. Quite often you will see here let and I use i equals zero. So we're going to start from zero. And we're going to continue doing this until i is smaller than the length of the array. In this case, we're going to use person dot social profiles dot length. This will give us the length of the array. And we don't have to hard code something. So as long as we don't change anything, that's totally fine. And additionally, we have to decide a way to increment this i. So I'm going to say here i++. plus plus. So i++ plus plus simply means increment i with 1. Increment means add 1. So we're going to have i with 0. i 1. i is equal to i is equal to 3 until the length of the array has been reached. Actually, before the length of the array has been reached, as you can see here, the condition is smaller than. And we're counting from zero because also the array index is from zero. It's not the easiest way to iterate of an array, but let's use console.log. I'm going to use here person.socialprofiles. And as you remember, in order to access an element from an array, we are using this bracket notation. Now, we're not going to write here 0, 1, 2, or anything else. We're going to use a variable. And the variable is i. So what this should do is to go over our entire array, and it will write Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. For many people getting started with this, <laughs> writing this code may look scary, and I, I totally understand it. This is one of the most basic structures that you will find in programming. And if you can work with this, that's totally fine. But there's also an easier way, an easier way, at least for beginners. So let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to simply remove this. And I'm going to use person.socialprofiles. 
And we have another built-in function, which is called for each. And if looking at for each, we have to provide an argument, which is a callback function. And I'm going to get in a second to what that callback function is. But we need to provide a callback function. And that callback function can have three arguments. We'll have the value, we'll have the index, and we can also get access to the original array. And this is even documented here. So let's go ahead and define another function. So we can see here function log items. And we can have here a property called item. We'll have here the index, and we don't really care about the array, so we're going to leave it behind. And what we're trying to do again is use console.log. And we already have the array. We can either get it from person.socialprofiles, or you can get it from here. That's also an option. Both options work just fine. So we can write here array and index. So that's a way to get an element. But what we can also do is simply write console.log and we'll have directly the item. So this will take it item by item. So let's provide here log items. Let's clear the console. And what you will see here is Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. What's important to notice here is that I haven't called log items. I've only provided the name of my callback function. And as the name implies, callback function is essentially something like we're providing this function for each, and for each knows when it needs to call it. We don't have to worry about it. It's sort of like, I will let you know when I have something for you. Don't worry about it. Just tell me which function I should call. I'm going to give you this data, and this is how it works. It's a bit different from the for loop, but that's the concept of a callback function. Now, in Postman, you'll be working with callback functions, and it's important to understand the concept of a callback function and how it works, especially because we're going to simplify this syntax a bit. The way it is right now, it's quite big. We want to make it a bit smaller. Now, we can provide this function directly here. So we're going to simply copy this and put it inside here. And at this point, we don't need log items because we're not going to reference it by this name. And in this case, we're creating an anonymous function. So just to test all the time that this is still working, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, so it's still working. So I now provided a callback function directly as an argument instead of writing it separately or storing it in a variable or anything like that. Moreover, we can use what's called an error function. An error function is when we're replacing function here and we're simply adding equal and greater than. It's a much modern way of defining a function. You will see here, these are still the parameters that we're using. So we can send that, that is still working. But what's interesting is that we can write here in our function whatever we want. But if our sole purpose is to lock this item, we can simplify it even more. We can simplify it that we actually remove everything that we have here and simply provide console.log because this is also a function. So now we are logging this from here. It's a bit different, but the main idea is still the same. So this is how you can create a for each. Most of the time, the way you want to have it is like this. You will have the item. You can add more code. You can add the index. You'll see here. Facebook is index zero. TikTok is index one. Instagram is index two. This is particularly useful if you're trying not just to log information, but let's say, for example, you want to figure out how many times does something appear or if something appears altogether. For example, we can define another variable. Let's say let has YouTube. And we're going to define it as false. 
So this is a Boolean value that we define to a variable. We're going to change these variables. We're using let. And we can combine what we know so far by creating a condition like if item equals, and we're going to three time equal YouTube. So if item equals YouTube, then we can set here has YouTube. We're going to set the value true. We have already initialized it with false. So if the social profiles has YouTube, we're going to initialize it with true. And here at the end, we can simply use console.log and log has YouTube. Of course, this will be initially false. But if we decide to add YouTube here to the list, make sure the syntax is still valid. OK. Then this will evaluate to true. Now let's get a bit closer to actually applying all this JavaScript knowledge that you have gathered so far for Postman, for writing Postman scripts, but also for writing Postman tests. And I'm going to start with a very simple example. I'm going to simply remove everything that I have here because it's no longer relevant. And from the right hand side, I will expand this panel here. And you'll see here the Postman snippet. Now the Postman snippets are a quick way for you to write some scripts. And one of the scripts here is to send a request. Now in Postman, you're already inside the request, but sometime maybe you need to create another request. And this is a very, very simple example showing you how you can send another request from the request itself. And this can be sometimes useful in terms of getting some data from somewhere else. And Let's try to understand what is going on here. I'm going to clear hit the console. I'm going to send this request. And I want you to notice the following. First of all, we have been using here HTTP bin.get. So this is the endpoint that we're calling initially. And when this response comes back, we are executing the tests. So we're executing any scripts that are available here. And one of the scripts is request. Now, as you can notice, send request is a function on the PM object, PM comes from Postman. It's essentially an object that includes some Postman specific things that we will use later on. But essentially PM.SendRequest allows you to send a request. And as you will see here, it allows you to specify the following parameters. First of all, you can provide request URL and you will see here, this is the first parameter. And the second parameter that's being given here is a callback. So again, a callback function. And the function is defined here. It contains an error. It contains a response. It tells you exactly what you should give as parameters. And this is one of the examples where it's really interesting to understand how this works. So for example, if I'm writing here console.log, and I'm writing here starting, and let's copy this statement and put in here, this is the end. Now, something interesting will happen. Now, essentially, you expect starting to be locked, then the response, and then this is the end, right? So I'm going to hit here, send. And you will see the following. You'll see starting. You'll see this is the end. And after that, this request has been sent and you see the response. And the reason for that is because this is a callback function and essentially send request is something that happens asynchronously from the rest of the execution. Essentially, JavaScript sends this request and this cannot happen in the same instance. It takes a bit, it sends the request out, the response comes back. So it says the following, essentially, well, give me this callback function because I will call that function when I have the response. And that will happen one second, two seconds, and even five seconds later. Meanwhile, the execution of the script is not blocked. But at the same time, if you want to work with the response, the response is not available here. The response is only available inside the callback function. So anything that you do with that response, for example, here you're using response.json to get the response as JSON and to log it. 
that is only available here inside a callback function. So this is like the concept of a callback function put into Postman. Now, in terms of using this send request from Postman, my advice, and that will save you a lot of time, my advice is to use this as little as possible. The scenarios where you really need to use pm.send request are relatively limited. And what's happening, and I'm seeing a lot of people, they're starting to write really complex requests. And with send requests, you can write more complex requests than this one. And they're getting errors and the entire JavaScript code is getting very complicated. And try as much as possible to use essentially this interface that Postman has and to chain multiple requests together if you need it. Don't rely so much on this part with the send request, okay? Good. Now, let's open up a completely new tab and you'll find this link that I'm pasting here. You'll find it in the video description. This is a mock response. Essentially, it's not a real API. It is an API that contains some data and you will see here this data is pretty similar to the objects that we've been using so far. It has a property name, age, and also social media profiles and things like that. So the idea here is to start writing some tests. So in Postman, in order to write tests, we're going to go here to the test tab. And we can manually inspect and see if these values look, you know, what we expect them to be. But in most cases, you want to write tests to document how the API is supposed to work. And from here, from the right hand side, from this snippets panel, we will use the following test. So, for example, let's test first for the status is 200. And again, you will notice here a pattern. So, pm.test, test is a function. It takes two parameters. So, the first parameter is the name of the test. The second parameter is again a callback function. This callback function will contain some assertions. You can write a callback function like this, but you can also write it using this error operator and it will look like this. So this will check essentially is the status 200. Yes, if that's the case, perfect. I'm not going to go too much into that because what I wanted to look into is to make the following assertions. I want to assert, for example, if the name is Jane. So in order to make this assertion, we're going to use another snippet from here and going to adapt it a bit. This is a snippet that allows us to check a value from the response, but we're going to do a few things to change it. So again, pm.test, what are we checking? Let's test the name. Testing the name. Okay, so this is the callback function, which includes all the assertions. This has to be inside a test. So this is pm.test. You notice here var. So we said we don't want to use var. Let's use const because we're going to get a response, yes? So what's happening? Well, this is the response, and this is JSON. And in order to get this response, we have to rely a bit on Postman. So we're going to get this response from pm.response that holds the response. But because we want to convert it to a JavaScript object, from JSON, we're going to call this JSON function. As you remember, like JSON parse, this will essentially parse from JSON into a JavaScript object. So response will be a JavaScript object containing these properties, name, age, and social media. Okay. So we can use here in an expectation pm.expect, another function. But this has a bit of a different syntax, so don't worry too much about it. But essentially, we have to put here pm.expect. What do we expect? For example, we expect 100 to equal 100, right? So this is like super simple. And this will pass because 100 is equal to 100. If we write here 101, we'll say, okay, 101 does not equal 100. Good. So we're going to use this super simple structure to create an assertion to test the property. So we want to test if response.name, because this is what we have here, name, equals chain. Okay. So as you remember, you need to put strings between quotes. Otherwise, this is not a string. JavaScript will think that you are trying to use the variable Jane, which is not the case. So now this works properly. It's also important, and I pointed it out before, 
It's also very important that you name your properties exactly as they are. So for example, if I write here response.name and I don't write name all in lowercase, I'm gonna get this error. And this error, it's an assertion error telling me expected undefined to deeply equal gene. So undefined, it means there is no property name written like this. So if there's no property name, then it is undefined. And undefined does not equal gene. For that reason, this will fail. So let's put it back, make sure that everything is still working properly. Now, let's say, for example, we want to test if Jane has Instagram. And you'll see here I have a list of social media profiles that Jane has. And I want to check for Instagram. Now, let's simply duplicate this test that we have here. So we can write here something like Jane has. Instagram. We're still parsing the response, even though we could essentially reuse what we have here. So we're using a statement multiple times. We can move it outside of PM test because otherwise it will not be available to other PM test functions. So we're moving it outside so it's available everywhere. And we're not sure exactly what we are asserting here. So this is like something we need to figure out. Now we can write here, you know, social media. So response dot social media, and which key is this? Zero one. So this is key one to equal Instagram, right? So we could write the assertion like this, and this will work. But what happens if Instagram is on the first position, or it changes on the fourth position, or? There's something added there and this order doesn't work anymore. So we, we cannot rely simply on hard coding these values in the response. It may work sometimes, but it's generally not a good practice. So for that reason, we need to figure out a way to search this array to see if we have Instagram. And we're going to come back to a very simple thing that we did before, and that is to iterate over the entire array. And that's, again, super, super simple. Let's say, for example, we're defining here a variable, let's say, let has Instagram equals false. Correctly write Instagram. So we're starting with Instagram as false, and we're making an assertion here. Okay, so we are asserting has Instagram, we want to have Instagram. So we want to write it has Instagram true. Pay attention to Booleans. This is not a Boolean as it is right now. This is a string. If I want to make it a Boolean, I have to remove the quotes. And now if I'm looking at it. We'll say here, expected false to deeply equal true. So this is still failing because we haven't checked anything essentially. But this is like our starting point and we're making sure that the test is failing. So we're going to have here response dot social media. Let me quickly check here. So I'm going to copy paste it so that they don't make any mistakes. And on this social media, I have for each. Now, since we're working with a response, you will not get this out of completion, which you've seen before. Maybe this will change in Postman, but for a moment, you have to work with it as it is right now. So no out complete, but if you practice with arrays, you know exactly how they work. So you know here, we have to give here our callback function, super simple. I'm going to get here the parameter, so it'll be an item. And then inside our functions, we can simply write if item equals Instagram, then we'll be able to set here has Instagram true. And nobody else will be able to set it to false because we are inside the if block. And we can now try it out has Instagram. Now the test is working. If we change it to something else that Jane doesn't have, for example, TikTok, we can change here TikTok. And the test will fail because it doesn't have TikTok in this list of items. All right. So this has been a very, very simple way of getting to this information. Still, this is a very simple response. And a response can 
even look like this. So let's take a look at an even more advanced scenario. And this is something that you may encounter in day-to-day -day situations. And you're looking at this and saying, okay, what is going on here? What do I have here? And you can still use console.log. So you can start with something if you having issues navigating through the response. Simply go to the response, parse the response, and you can use console.log and then log it. Then you can start navigating property by property as a way to understand what's going on. So you will see here at the first level, this is an object, okay? You can have at the first level also an array, so simply a list of something, and then you'll have to work directly with array. This is an object. So we know that the first thing in an object is a property called response. It's a bit unusual, but this is the property name. So in order to navigate more through this, depending on which level you want to go, but you're going to use response.response .response because this is the property from the response. And then we have here meta info and a timestamp. So this is like a nested object altogether. Not so interesting. And then we have data. So let's say, you know, we want to get data, results, address, active, for example. We want to get this active property here. Okay, so it's, it's pretty, pretty hidden from us. So if you don't understand objects and arrays very well, we're going to have a hard time getting to that respective property. So as you can see, we have response, so we have data. So the next step would be to write here data. And what does data contain? Now data, as you notice, is an array. So what does it contain? Well, it contains a big object, and apparently it contains only an object. So we can run it again. You will see here the size of this array is one, so it contains only one item. So in this case, we will just get the first item if this is what we're trying to do. And after getting this first item, what do we have here? Well, we have an object again. We have an object that contains type, data ID, results. So what we're interested in is again in results. So we have to use the dot notation to get inside results. And again, results is also an array. So again, we'll see here, okay, we have two results. The first result, the second result. Okay, so let's say we are interested in the first result. So again, I'm gonna get here the first element from the results. And what are we interested in? We're interested in address. So this is another property that we're accessing here. So we're getting the address. Now we have the address. And inside the address, we finally get to this property active, which for this case, it's false. But just to give an example like this is how you navigate through this entire thing. Now, let's imagine a test where we need to check that at least you will see here that this result has two addresses. And we need to check that at least one address is active, okay? So it means, first of all, we have to figure out, we have to get to these results so that we can iterate over them, okay? So let's simplify this. We're gonna write here, define a constant called here addresses. And we are gonna copy this entire path here with the results without accessing any of the keys. So this is just to, to make our life a bit easier. So we are here. Results is an array, it means addresses is an array. So what we can do here is try something like addresses dot for each. And again, as you know, we're gonna pass here our callback function. And using the previous logic that we had before, we can define here has one active, we can define here a Boolean. We're gonna assume that there is no active address. So for each address, what you're gonna do, we're gonna look here and say, if address dot, so what's this? We have results, this is an object, and then we have address. Now I see at this point, the name that I've given is not the best one. 
So instead of addresses, maybe you should call it here results. Changing it here in results, and I also have to change it overall where I have it. Don't be afraid to do this kind of changes. You cannot always know in advance how you're going to name variables. It's important that you figure out a name that also makes sense when you're checking this later or if somebody else is reading your code. So if results that address dot, and actually this will be a result. So this is the first result. And it's not the first result. It's one of the results that we're getting. And the result will have an address and the address will have this property false. Okay. So if result that address dot active, equals 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 true then we're gonna set here this property has one active address gonna set it to true super simple and if at any point in time you're unsure what you're getting here okay or somehow it's not getting inside this if block use console log to log whatever condition you have you can even lock this entire condition here and figure out why isn't this working or what's the value of this? This will help you understand what your code is doing. Okay. So finally, I will, this level, I'm just going to simply log this console.log. Now right here, simple message has active address. I'm going to write this value. So you can go ahead and write a test. It's pretty similar to what we had before but the main idea still remains the same. Clear this, run this again. So it has one active address. You will see here, the first value, this is false. The entire statement here, the entire expression here is false. Or the second one is true, true equals true. We're changing the value of this variable and then we are able to lock this. So this is how you can navigate even like complex objects. You don't have to worry about them too much because apart from either being an object or an array and them having been nested together, like arrays containing objects and object containing other arrays and so on. Once you understand what you're dealing with and the way you're accessing the different properties that you have, I'm sure that you will not have any issues getting this to work. Well, that's about it in terms of the basics around JavaScript for Postman. If this tutorial was helpful, consider liking and subscribing. And as you have noticed, we did not get very deep into API testing as the main focus has been JavaScript. So if you want to explore writing more tests in Postman, I'll link your tutorial right here on the screen. And if you want to learn more about APIs in Postman, I have created a complete Postman course where I walk you through the entire process of testing APIs including how to automate the tests with Postman and Newman and CI CD tools like Jenkins or GitLab CI. It's more than 14 hours of pure content and many people just getting started with APIs found it extremely useful. If you're interested, you'll find the link in the video description as well as other useful resources. Thank you very much for dropping by and I hope to see you next time.